welcome back. We're Thank glad you. to Good have to you. Back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were just having a very interesting conversation in the green room beforehand, talking about, uh, well, lots of things. Um, especially, well, you know, Rob was commenting in the, um, in the chat about coffee. So of course that got us started talking about coffee again. That's a regular occurrence here on the show. So, Hey, Nathan and Alan and Rob, we've got them talking in the chat already. And, uh, we've got some other folks joining us as well. Let's see who we've got here. We've got Robin and, well, my thing just scrolled. Robin and Charlie and Praveen and Zach and Michael and Kurt, Artem and Will, Andy and uh, Mario and Jamie. So welcome. Oh, Jennifer. Thanks, y'all, for coming. We're glad to see you. So um, we have some good stuff today. Oh, Jamie said aloha instead of hello. So all right. Aloha back to you, Jamie. Yes, uh, I could say that, you know, y'all are starting to feel like Ohana as we go along and back week after week, and we love it. We've got some really great stuff going on today. We'll do our usually our usual community update. <clears throat> and uh, we got one thing on product that we want to talk about before we jump in with what uh, Sergey has going on. Lots of stuff around Android and, oh, lots of cool updates. Woo! Can't wait to share that with you. It's going to be awesome. And we already pre-tested the PowerPoint or the uh, the slideshow, not PowerPoint, Google Slides, but uh, it worked then. So I hope I'm not testing the presentation gods because it did work. And so we should be good to go today. Crossing my fingers on the technology stuff because everybody worked inside the green room and Irvishi just went, Irvishi, don't be playing those games. That's not cool. Okay. She's turning up the ceiling fan. I'm like, that timing is not cool, Irvishi. We're going to give you a hard time about that. But, um, oh, thanks, Jamie. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your comment about my hair. Just freshly retouched. So, yes, it is popping. Tad says three phase electrical, that's IT. Oh, must be going back to Rob's comments about the metal building. And if something is plugged in, uh, that's IT area, right? I tell you what, um, people think everything is, is IT if it's electrical or electronic in any way. No, no, slap their hand. All right, so uh, starting with the community update, we've got several things going on in the community. Uh, Dar Dario, oh wait, I, I had it earlier. Dario Vernelli um, has a great script in about exporting users and password expiration dates. So if that's something that you need some help on, go check out that script. And Sean has auto enroll your servers to Jump Cloud Windows servers. If you need help with that, there's another script. And uh, WM Clean has asked a question in software and hardware about how do I create wallpaper policy for Mac devices that also changes the image on the lock sign-in screen. So if you are so inclined and can help with that, please go take a look at that and maybe answer their question. And then one of our product managers has a question in the product discussions board. Niraj has asked about device health monitoring and would love you to give some input. And I know how much y'all love to give your opinions, which we absolutely love. I mean that in the best way possible. Niraj is saying that we're exploring the development of a device health monitoring and alerting solution. And this tool would, would help y'all keep track of your device's performance posture, potential issues, and provide alerts when attention is needed. He's got a list of some questions and uh, he would really, really love some of you to go ahead and give some comments there on that thread in the community. So please go over and tell us what you think and what would be helpful if we were to develop something like that. So please, please go give Naraj your thoughts on that because he has um, asked me to make sure you're aware that's on there. 
so that uh, he can see what you think. And um, that was all that I had because I wanted to make sure that Sergi has uh, plenty of time to talk about the several topics he has ready for us. So please, what you got for us? Awesome. Yeah, let me share that screen we were talking about. We did test that, so it should be working. Let me know when it comes up. We can see it. Yay! Awesome. Hey, folks. Great to be back. Uh, Sergio Bell's here. I'm the principal product manager for mobility. So when we say mobility, what does that mean? iOS, iPad OS, Android, and how we manage those devices. And we're starting to bleed a little bit more into the, the mobile applications and how we deliver those and some of the jump cloud applications and making sure that complete overarching experience is ideal for you, our customers. So a couple of things that I want to go through. Well, one, uh, just a slight disclaimer, some of these slides will have the GA items, some of them will have their things that we're launching in early access here in the next couple of days and a few roadmap related items. I wanted to give a complete overview or a broad overview of the mobility and how we're progressing. So excited to be here with you. So generally when we're talking about mobility, there's certain sort of stages we're talking that our customers are engaging with us. One is basic endpoint security. They really want to just enroll their corporate or their BYO de devices, apply maybe a passcode policy, maybe do a slight OS configuration. From there, that evolution starts. And what we here at JumpCloud have been doing is working to gradually get to that last stage where we can offer a complete breadth of capabilities, whether that is the configuration of device level or user level, applications, user-centric policies, as well as start integrating some of what I call the Jump Cloud DNA with the identity and device management pieces with mobile SSO and other security capabilities. So we'll be talking about sort of the capabilities we've been incorporating into our product or our platform, uh, but let's start off with Android EMM, Android Enterprise Mobility Management. So EMM offers a great level of flexibility from when you're looking at BYOD devices to being very, you know, privacy centric, uh, to all the way to locking down a completely controlling a device from a dedicated device perspective. So, uh, we here at Jump Cloud offer support on all four of these use cases. Uh, these are able to be enrolled. All the company owned devices can even be zero touch enrolled as well. And we've been incrementally adding more policies and other capabilities so that you can really address them from a complete perspective. So let's talk what has been new since I last joined you guys. Well, one, we've added a number of either tweaks to existing policies or some new policies. So our application and device based restrictions policies received some new tweaks. We put out a new proxy settings policy, a VPN policy, as well as added that Mac randomization uh, key to the Wi-Fi policy. Some other capabilities were compliance and enforcement. So often customers are like, hey, how can I force that passcode to ensure to be insured on that device? Or how can I take either wipe or uh, mitigate or limit those access to that work container or to the work profile? That's where the compliance policy or compliance enforcement capabilities come into play. And the last one has been kiosk mode. So uh, last year we introduced uh, both uh, fully managed and dedicated devices with that we launched kiosk mode to be able to facilitate locking down those dedicated devices to either a single application or to a, a customizable launcher experience well some of those decisions that we launched were uh to get out to market make sure you were able to start using and providing feedback with that there were some uh items that we needed to continue building upon so one we now uh, have removed the limitation of applying applications to dedicated devices only via the kiosk policy. So now if you enroll a dedicated device and your intention is to manage a couple of applications on that device, but you don't want to put it in a launcher or a single app mode, you're able to do so. In fact, with this particular change, as you make uh, software management assignments, we will synchronize them into the policy structure so that when you go to build, if you want to apply a kiosk mode policy, 
that those will sort of have a uh, lightweight synchronization between them. So if you want to apply runtime permissions, if you want to configure and modify the managed configuration of your respectable application, you don't have to touch the kiosk policy. The kiosk policy references those applications and you'll be able to update them. So I know we had a number of feedback from our customers that wanted to get very detailed on each application control, which prompts they have when they're in the launcher in the single app mode, you'll now be able to do so uh, via the software management tab or uh, page. And then you can comfortably leave your kiosk load policies alone and they'll continue to stay up to date. Additionally, there was a request of how do we get access to settings uh, if I'm in launcher mode. So now uh, if you uh, enable under the device settings of the policy, uh, the option of uh, utilizing settings, we will actually push that application onto your launcher. So we will pair with all of those applications there. From there, uh, we are looking at a number of other roadmap items. Uh, one is uh, Google within the last six months has released capabilities for Android loss mode. So we are excited to uh, work on this. This is something that we anticipate coming in the next quarter or so, where you as an IT admin will be able to go so far as to uh, mark those company-owned devices as lost. If it's a fully managed, dedicated, or even that company-owned work profile or Coke device, depending that they meet the OS level requirements, you'll be able to come in, set a lot of settings, whether that's a message, a phone number, an email, a plethora of capabilities. And when you enable it in loss mode, that information will propagate to that mobile device. It will stay locked. It will give you the information. And once you've located said device, you'll be able to come in and remove that particular loss mode or disable or deactivate loss mode. And we will have the according labels throughout the console in the list view, as well as in the device details so that you're aware if you're trying to track down a particular device. So, Next piece that I'd like to talk about is something that we've been working with Google on and uh, that Google launched as an announcement a little while back. Uh, they've been innovating on this for some time. It's called Better Together Enterprise. You may have heard their Better Together consumer story. Well, they're also uh, looking to streamline their enterprise story. So what is that? Well, their goal is really to unify how uh, people approach Google devices. Currently, whether you're approaching Android, Chrome OS, Chrome browser, as a quite a segmented approach, both from an identity and a customer signup and management process. So uh, this is an objective in multiple phases to unify how you can effectively address them. And this is not necessarily tied to how you do that via Google Workspace, but how MDMs or EMM vendors can utilize that with integrations to Google. So uh, one of the things that has been a shortcoming has been the identity. So when you attempt to access it from an Android perspective, if you're using legacy approaches, there may be a DPC or device policy control or integration. On Chrome OS, there might be a, a slightly modified identity. With this, there will be a standardization on the user identity. It will be an enterprise Google account rather than a managed Google Play account uh, in that regard. So what that transpires to is at the moment, or uh, Google previously supported three types of enterprise enrollments. One was a customer managed, the second one is EMM managed and a Google domain-based enterprise. With that, they are consolidating into one approach. That will be a customer managed enterprise. So uh, you'll be able to create a Google managed domain after email verification, uh, it will still continue, it will work with existing Google managed domains as well. So wanted to clarify this piece, we already support out the gate. So uh, for those of you that may have signed up with a Google or a Gmail account, uh, you'll be able to continue utilizing them. There, Google does intend to have a migration path at some point, but for any net new customers out there, they will be able to now sign up with their enterprise Google workspace domain account. So. Another piece of the functionality that I mentioned was there's a plethora of identities that Google sort of allows or 
are incorporated in the Android enterprise environment. There will be potentially the organization's user directory. If you have a separate uh, EMM solution, in this case, you will have a unified user directory and uh, EMM provider with Jump Cloud. And then Google maintains some level of information on that. Those Google Play accounts, they're typically focused on redeeming of the applications. They don't do much beyond synchronizing of uh, email or anything like that. So. Uh, those accounts will be consolidated to that enterprise Google account in the near future. So uh, excited to have that capability in the future. So uh, wanted to showcase what that transpires or what that looks like in the console today. So in the past, whenever you went to sign up for Android EMM, you'd be prompted with some of these particular screens. I would say bring uh, Android to work you needed to use or generate a Gmail account. Uh, I know that was a pain point for a number of our customers. If you're using Google Workspace, you prefer to have that security capabilities or management of that particular uh, account under a unified IT umbrella. Well, in this case, you had to generate a Gmail account. It would establish a communication. You'd have to specify the business requirements and complete it. It was a very simple process, but at times that security threshold would be problematic for customers. Well, moving forward, you start off in the uh, UI, very straightforward, same experience. Uh, but when you say to begin registration, it actually prompts you to either create or use an existing Google Workspace account. So if you're creating one, it will do some level of verification for you. Otherwise, it will establish a binding with your current Google domain. At that point, you complete that binding. Again, very straightforward processes. And now you're back in the Jump Cloud portal or the Jump Cloud console, and you're able to start managing those devices outright. The user identities is a secondary phase that Google is working on. And we're uh, excited that as they make those capabilities available, we will also look to integrate into the Jump Cloud console and offer those capabilities to you. That's something that will be coming in the future. And I look forward to coming back and sharing that with you. Um, let's shift focus slightly to iOS and iPadOS device management. So when we're looking at iOS devices, again, similar to Android, there's a plethora of capabilities, whether you're focused on a BYOD use case, that's the, your answer in this case, and Apple's answer is user enrollment. They are working on multiple flavors, but in general, there's user enrollment. When you start looking at company-owned devices, there's device enrollment or profile-driven device enrollment, as well as automated device enrollment. In all of these use cases, Jump Cloud supports those capabilities. So what I'm excited to share today is we are finally going to be launching an EA for VPP on user enrollment. Historically, we've supported application, VPP applications on just company-owned devices, but user enrollments are coming. So there was the notion of associating with a device ID. Uh, moving forward, you'll be able to associate to a managed Apple ID. And when you're redeeming it on a user-based approach, it will redeem one license to a user. So that single user may install uh, that application or may get that application installed on multiple of their managed devices if you have those use of cases, an iPhone, an iPad, and maybe a applicable approach there in the enterprise. So, and with that, you'll be able to do custom configurations for each of the applications. So I wanna pause here and mention that if you are interested, feel free to reach out to either your account executive, your customer success manager, or reach out directly to myself at sergi.bellis at jumpcloud.com. We are looking to launch the EA in the next couple of days within the next week or so. So we'd love to be able to have you test that experience and provide feedback so that we can, if necessary, refine further and get that into market for you to be able to use in production use cases. Yep. And Urvashi, thank you for posting my email there. A um, couple of other items we are working on that are roadmap for iOS. So as you can see, we're delivered at significant capabilities on Android. We're continuing to close out some of our minor gaps in the iOS side so that they are complete, whether it's BYO to complete uh, corporate use cases that are addressed. You'll start seeing a lot more parity coming into effect. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we're looking to catch up on are the ability to delete passcodes. That's both a device passcode as well as a restrictions password. They are applicable to 
company owned devices. So feel free to make sure to pay attention to the corresponding prerequisites on the supervision or the OS level version, but those will be coming in the not so distant future, as well as another application capability, which is a single app mode policy. So similar to how we have kiosk mode and we've blended both a launcher and single app mode into one. This is sort of uh, Apple's answer on how you can lock down a particular application on that iPhone or iPad device. So we'll be looking to synchronize based on that VPP list or a specified bundle ID. You'll be able to have some additional optional settings. That way, those uh, whether those are uh, Kiosk related iPads or a, you know, uh, in a company meeting or a, a Zoom room or something like that, that you need to lock it into a single application, you'll be able to do so and the end user won't be able to mess around with that at that point. So something that we're excited to bring in a, a, a here not so distant future as well. Last point is in terms of parity, we will be launching both loss mode for Android as well as iOS. So the, you as IT admins will be able to mark those supervised devices as lost. Similar behavior, you'll be able to specify information, it'll lock it in. The labels will appear throughout the console so that as you work to track that down, it'll be incorporated. Some of the subsequent enhancements that we will be exploring for loss mode will be an ability to apply a, uh, uh, play a sound on the lost iOS devices, as well as when in loss mode, there is some elevated uh, location services that gets can be requested from the MDM vendor uh, from the particular device. And as we look to incorporate those, we'll be able to surface them up in a subsequent enhancement there. And finally, we are working on SSO extension, single sign-on extension policy. You'll be able to configure that. There's a number of vendors out there that are starting to use these capabilities to streamline uh, authentication or entry into certain uh, endpoints. This one will be applicable specifically for one of our next items. That is a very, very interesting piece that has been quite near and dear to my heart. That is mobile device trust. So conditional access for mobile devices. So generally, when we are talking to our customers, a simple objective they have is they want to lock down and conditionally manage access to company resources for all devices, whether that is desktop, whether that's mobile. So that is something that we are taking to heart. We've been working on for a little while now, and you've been asking quite uh, repeatedly for that. We're excited that we are making strides in this. So there will be some platform differences. So when you're looking on the desktop side, the current delivery mechanism that we're leveraging is the jump cloud agent and we're pushing it via when you enable the global certificate distribution that is our trust anchor it comes down on every desktop and when you look to authenticate to an sso endpoint we evaluate that to determine one if the device is trusted and managed on ios because there's not a typical notion of an agent because uh, those mdm protocols are built into uh, ios or into Android explicitly, we needed a vehicle by which we can deliver a, a particular capability. So we are looking to leverage Jump Cloud Protect, our MFA application. It will uh, be pushed onto those corresponding devices. So whether those are user role devices, fully managed Android devices, any and all of the managed uh, mobile devices will be able to get Jump Cloud onto their device. And with that, we will establish a trust anchor with a device user refresh token. That refresh token will be stored in the secure enclave of the Android or iOS device to make sure that they are phishing and tamper resistant or uh, tamper proof at that point. Uh, so those are some of the enhancements. You will see future announcements or future enhancements on how we will further bolster our desktop strategy, but we're really leaning into leveraging Jump Cloud Go and the deployment of those DIRTs or the device user refresh tokens to make sure that the access that we're providing as one is uh, validating the device, the user, and is conditionally approving you to those appropriate resources. So we're gonna look to level our conditional access policies. Historically, they've only applied to desktop policies when it's that is the device manager disk encryption or whatnot. We'll be looking to add additional conditions into our policy builder. So let's take a look at a couple of them first. So 
Um, what that will look like will be the following. So we will have an OS family or operating system type that you'll be able to select. You'll be able to select on the basis of desktop or mobile, and you'll be able to specify iOS or Android. Additionally, that device is GemCloud managed, will receive an up, a UI update of device management is GemCloud managed. Uh, we're also exploring the notion of registered, but as part of our MVP, we will be focusing on those managed devices. So that's something that we're quite excited about. So coming back to it, what would that look like? Some of the requirements for you will be GemCloud Go will need to be enabled. For whether you're using Android or iOS or both, you'll need to configure Android EMM and, and Apple MDM and VPP. That will be the VPP will be the distribution of the iOS protect application. You'll configure and push protect to those mobile devices. And then our expectation is you'll set the appropriate conditional access policies to your liking for each of your SSO user portal configurations at that point. And we're going to look to have a little bit of a guided experience. Uh, you'll see the conditional access piece receive a few additional tabs. Right now, you have, we have kind of a unified policies tab. We'll be looking to add a device trust and a settings sub tabs. We'll encourage you to set up Jump Cloud Go if that's not enabled. And if you don't have device certs enabled, you'll be able to get those enabled. And then we'll call out whether or not there are any policies that have the device management condition in place. From there, we'll call out the sections of prerequisites for desktop, which is right now just the global certificate distribution. For iOS, there'll be Go, MDM, VPP, and Protect. And on Android, similarly, Go, EMM, and Protect. So we'll call those out. We'll do tests and validations if those are present or appropriately configured. That way, you can confidently set up your policies and one test and then look to deploy in full scale there. So something that uh, we'd love to one uh, get some feedback from customers as we get closer into EA. That's something that we'll announce uh, in the uh, most likely in our Q2 timeframe. So be on the lookout for that. I'll be back on IT hours to speak when we're closer to that on the final details as customers can look to join those early access and start testing that. So hey, really excited about those capabilities. Before you move on, um, Nick wants to know, is there a policy for patch management for iOS and with Android OS policy to hide the non-work profile after enrollment? Gotcha. So two different questions. Uh, the patch management for iOS, uh, that isn't in the works just yet. Uh, we are actually starting to work on or uh, go through the uh, declarative device management. Once we have that platform added upon the MDM piece, we will be able to receive more accurate information real time. It's declarative. So we will be able to instantiate the policies and that will be our answer to patching of iOS and iPadOS devices. That will should actually help further enhance our macOS patching for the operating systems as well. Uh, the second piece was relative to Android devices. So if you are enrolling as a work profile, whether that is a co-company owned device or a personal device, uh, the intention is to have two separate uh, profiles. One is for work related purposes. The other one is for personal. If your intention is to only have a work related sort of container, then I would say that your approach should be fully managed devices. Uh, so at that point, you would go through and set it up in that capacity. But I'd love to understand a little bit more on what you're thinking about in that capacity. Yeah, because uh, Nick had said um, hide the non-work profile after enrollment. So I'm not sure whether they're still wanting to use the non-work profile um, or exactly what the use case is there. So Nick, if in the comments you can add a little bit more context about hiding the non-work profile and what you're you're looking for there, that would that'd be really great. And I would say a couple of points is we've seen scenarios where customers don't want to ask their end users to factory reset the device because all company managed devices, the way Google approaches and the uh, Android management protocol requires is uh, whether it's cope, fully managed or dedicated, you have to factory reset and at the factory reset screen, you touch, tap on six times and scan that QR code. So we've seen customers ask, can they apply the UIO work profile to company owned devices. That's generally not a Google nor a Jump Cloud recommended approach. 
And once that arises, then it's you can't easily elevate up. Uh, so it, you have to just factor a reset. So I don't know if that's necessarily the exact way that uh, Nick is approaching it, but generally we try and separate those two independently. Uh, assess what is the ownership type and what are the use cases and drive the enrollment accordingly. Okay. If there are any other questions, feel free to keep them coming. Love those things. So uh, I think we covered on some of those, some of the new conditions will be a device management and operating system. Uh, so excited to bring those to you. You'll be able to, if you have a desktop and you're comfortable locking down your desktop devices to only uh, trusted access and you wanna do some testing on your mobile devices, you will have those conditions to where you'll be able to deploy separate policies for different use cases to make sure that you first validate them uh, with your IT teams, your, you know, uh, your Vanguard teams and whatnot. So uh, go through those progressions there. Uh, what that will, potentially look like is, for example, if you are going on the Android side and you are attempting to access Slack, you put in your credentials. At that point, you, Slack is uh, an SSO application you have integrated in GemCloud. We will redirect to console.gemcloud.com uh, for that login. You'll be able to select to login with GemCloud Go. What we will do is we will communicate and behind the scenes, a trusted connection will be open to Jump Cloud Protect, and it will determine if there is a DIRT available. If it is, with biometrics, you will be able to uh, retrieve that DIRT and pass it along. The DIRT will contain a number of key uh, pieces. One, the identifier of the device, the organization, the user. We will have built-in capabilities for device attestation. For Google, it will be Google's device attestation checks on iOS. It will be iOS's. Um, device compliance or device attestation capabilities. Pending you pass those conditions and that it matches for the conditions you've set on Jump Cloud, we will allow you to pass in and that will be sort of your native experience with that login window. On iOS, uh, the experience will be ever so slightly different. It will be, you'll start off in Slack, you'll enter those credentials and instead of us opening a console.jumpcloud.com, the SSO extension. So we're building an SSO extension into Jump Cloud Protect, and it will take over that particular session. It will be able to communicate with uh, Protect and retrieve that DIRT if, that's, uh, if that is available. If not, you will do a DIRT registration. There will be a one-time registration piece, and they'll pass that along. So you will not have to leave. You will not have to navigate outside of either Safari or Slack and to protect, to complete those actions. The intention is to keep you within the app that, and keep you focused and introduce those authentication flows respectfully into either Slack or Safari and whatnot while pulling from a secure application like Jump Cloud Protect. So that really brings us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, so a couple of recaps, enhancements on Kiosk Mode and Better Together Enterprise on Android, launching EA for VPP on user enrollment, and we are hard at work on mobile device trust and look forward to bringing you more information in Q2. So thank you very much. I look forward to if there are any other questions. Wow, thank you so much. Lots of great stuff coming. I'm very excited about the roadmap stuff. I saw a lot of excitement in the chat. I don't know if you were able to see the comments that I threw up on screen because it's kind of tough when you're presenting, but a uh, lot of excitement along so many things. Uh, there was, this has made my Friday from Stuart and Kelly Love was that. saying a big woohoo on some of the stuff. So especially around the conditional access and stuff like that. So definitely you hit some, some highlights in there that, uh, People are excited about, oh, Kelly just put in a new one. It looks like, thanks, Urbishi. Um, Price for granting EA. <laughs> you mean one sacrificial goat. Yeah, so definitely uh, for the iOS VPP piece, well, reach out. We'll look to get you guys for your organization's provision, and we'll send out some uh, announcements or targeting our EA customers, and that will become an available GA. Uh, that's not a problem. And then look, look, be on the lookout for the mobile device trust EA. That's something that's going to have a lot of motion around it. 
And as you, as I can tell on the chat, there will be a lot of excitement as well. And we appreciate feedback, any use cases, edge cases, we want to make sure we account for those or have a roadmap to address them. The biggest price for being a participant in the betas and the EAs is just feedback. You know, uh, it's not just about getting in there and using it. Uh, we need your comments and your, you're telling us what is working for you and not working or telling us, well, I really like this, but here's where I could use some more help or, you know, t telling us what your, where it fits your use case and where it doesn't. I mean, that is really important. It's, it's not just about you using it and going, oh, hey, cool. It is about the participation in telling us what you think. Uh, that is where our product team is going to be making some more changes this year in seeking that active participation instead of just granting you access and saying, okay, here you go. It's you need to be willing to tell us what you think in order to participate. So that's going to be a really key part of things. Um, that's, that's a little bit of a change from the past where we've just granted access and said, here you go. I mean, the talking to us is going to be really important going forward because you know, we, we can't make improvements if you don't tell us uh, more about how you're using it and why it's working or not working for you. So we've got some more comments. Question. Yeah, Brandon's, uh, will JumpCloud auto push MDM when someone signs into their Google Workspace account on a device? Yeah, so we are looking at those use cases as part of MVP. We will essentially, if you are not managed, we will block you and your end users will be able to uh, enroll after the fact and, re and attempt that. Uh, we would love to hear specific use cases because there are nuances both on Android and iOS devices. For example, if you are on a company managed device and we block you, our answer is going to be you have to first factory reset the device and then enroll with an enrollment token. So there's not a automatic push of MDM if that's iOS related. So we are currently looking to uh, at account driven user and device enrollment. So to, Account-driven device enrollment was introduced by Apple last WWDC 23. So that requires a little bit of Apple and Google uh, Federation. Once that's in effect, uh, you'll be able to more seamlessly do account-driven enrollment. So that will be both applicable to user and device use cases. From there, we will explore remediation screens. So if you do get blocked, uh, can we detect the rationale of why you're blocked by conditional access policy? And without exposing all the checks we're doing, we wanna make sure we give a user a potential for self-remediation. If it's you're blocked because you're not enrolled and we can be confident that that's a BYOD device and we can offer them a solution of how they can remediate, we will look to to incorporate that in those, instead of just a, giving a blank, a blanket, hey, you don't meet the criteria or whatnot, we wanna make sure we can elaborate on why so that you can remediate. If it's an OS version, hey, you haven't updated it and we don't have OS patching, or if it's a BYOD device and they're running for some reason iOS 16 instead of iOS 18 when it's out, being able to surface something like that and say, hey, we can't force an update on a personal iOS device, but we require iOS 17.4.1, whatnot. That would be something that we would explore as remediation screens so that those end users can mitigate them and come back and access those resources quite straightforwardly. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think Brandon had elaborated a little bit. He said he ran into a blocker on native Google MDM, which doesn't have custom profiles for iOS, uh, which was the blocker for one of their apps. Yeah, so uh, custom profiles are available on both iOS and on Android side in the Jump Cloud platform. So you'll be able to use that. But I know that Brandon, if you're trying to you know, initiate when the user first starts doing something with their at uh, company domain and want to redirect them, Google typically is able to detect that. The conditional access policies once in effect on mobile side will first 
prevent you from proceeding with that. And as we continue to expand on those capabilities, we'd look to either direct you to management or to direct you to mitigate whatever device level conditions you have not met. Great. And Nathan had some feedback on the feedback saying, good reminder, hopefully there will be follow-ups from product after granting EA access. Um, you know, sometimes they get busy and just forget to circle back. So I think that's a good call out, Nathan, that it's not just on us to say, hey, you uh, you need to give us feedback, but to put a couple of reminders, especially if we're doing something, because sometimes we will do like a private channel in the lounge so that we can collect all of the feedback in one place. Cause I know it can be confusing if it's like, Oh, talk to your account manager or talk to your TAM or, you know, give pro give feedback directly to the product manager. So sometimes we will do just a, a channel where the participants can just put all your feedback in one place. And then if someone says something that reminds you of something, you can respond to that. And it kind of allows everyone to discuss what they are doing and what, what they're seeing. And then you can build on that or say, Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that. And then you can go test something or add your feedback on top of theirs. So we're experimenting with that with a couple of the recent, you know, betas and early access programs. So that that's a good reminder to, we also need to make sure we follow up and say, Hey, have, do you have any feedback? But we are going to you know, push a little bit on y'all to be active participants um, as a condition of if you're going to do this, then we need you to be proactive and do it. But I totally understand. I get busy and forget sometimes too. So we'll try to remind our PMs to please at least follow up a, a couple of times to remind everyone that this is active. Please test and tell us what you think. And I definitely appreciate the feedback there, right? It's not hot potato where we just toss it over to you and say, tag, you're it. That's not fair. Uh, at the same time, uh, you'll see more frequently if it's a longer EA and we're doing incremental fixes, uh, we'll at, at times repost or reach out to the EA customer saying, hey, FYI, here's the changes since we launched EA. But we could probably look to be a little bit more of a, a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, how are you progressing on that? So, and thank you. also, um what do you think about, you know, having a series of questions that you drip out over, uh, you know, the time saying, have you tested this? What do you think about this particular feature or, or things like that? So, cause sometimes that'll help people instead of just, you know, meandering around something, but to have prompts that say, you know, this week, can you focus on this and what do you think about it? And, and stuff like that, cause that'll remind people to go back in and also, give, I know you don't always want to lead people, but sometimes just giving them a, a place to focus on just kind of helps them. Oh yeah. I need to go back in there and I'll look at this. And then they'll kind of wander around and find other things too, but it, it gives them something to think about and, and work on. So do you all do that during the, during the EAs or do you just kind of let people wander around and Sometimes do at the thing. launch of EA will summarize sort of the areas of where we would suggest they focus their attention, right? Sometimes it's a broad platform and we want to hone in and say, we're editing this, we've edited this, and this is what's behind the scenes. So make sure you test X, Y, and Z use case. But at times we don't know every single permutation. So we'll point you there. But if you, if we've missed something, that's where we'd love for, for you to feedback, provide the feedback of what's the use case you're testing so that we can make sure that moving forward that we're accounting in our automation testing as well as in our other product considerations. Yeah, makes sense. And it looks like um, Urvashi is finding an answer for Brian's off-topic questions um, on, uh, well, I mean, Brian says it's off-topic. I'm not, I'm not, you know, accusing you of any, <laughs> accusing Brian of anything about exporting JC configuration settings as a JSON or CSV. So Urvashi, thank you for working the background and pulling that up quickly. And uh, Sergi, it looks like you have paparazzi in your um, office. <laughs> Everyone's so always get a big flash. So what happens is I have a, a motion or vacancy sensor in my office, and sometimes it's behind the door and it 
since it's some motion, so I'll sometimes be like waving off to the side to make sure it's always active as like a 30 or 15 minute setting. I need to revisit that. <laughs> it looked it like was lightning outside as well. So that I think that's what it was. More. Yeah. Cause it kind of looked like either a light bulb was, was flashing and having trouble or you've actually got some paparazzi standing behind your monitor, you know, taking some action photos of you every once in a while. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. So I think Urvashi, you are up. What's going on in the news? And yes, I saw your very last one and you're playing with fire. You definitely want leave that one till the end, but um you're pushing it. On that one. <laughs> okay, what's in the news? Oh, <laughs> yes. Okay. That, that's so, a that's a fireball right there. All right, we won't we won't get into it. Eh, we might. But now everybody wants to know. Yep. Um I'll I'll leave out the name. But <laughs> let's start at the beginning. So I don't know if, if you all have seen this, but there is an article in Computer World saying um, admin C snags as Mac OS Sonoma 14.4 hits Macs. So there appear to be a couple of snags in the latest iteration of Mac OS Sonoma that are upsetting to Apple admins. So firstly, I think there's some USB hubs are no longer being recognized by the Mac and a popular command tool to restart services on remote Apple devices is no longer supported. So that seems to have gotten in the way for everybody. And there's another problem uh, concerning printing, where admins are complaining that previously set up printers are disappearing from Macs since the update. The article does say that it's not like a uniform issue, and like some people are seeing it and some people aren't. So I don't know how they're going to fix that because replication is key to like <laughs> logging a bug. So I think it might just be like a bad luck kind of update. Oh man, and it's bad enough that you know half the admins hate dealing with printers anyway so yeah kelly says oh goody more printer problems exactly what <laughs> i was thinking kelly especially after our discussion either last week or the week before about yeah. going office space on um printers out in the middle of a field <laughs> like we were talking about that needs to be like a a rage room or yes, some for cathartic activity for it admins um Maybe we should try to get the PSU Mac admins team to do that during the conference and just take everybody out to the middle of a field and bash old printers. <laughs> and it'll be fun because bash is what you use for scripting on. But it's, anyway. Yeah. But oh, yeah, I made that joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that Brandon is like, Windows is really good at nuking printers with updates. So Mac OS needs to get on the Windows level. If you're going to nuke the printers, commit to it. What is this? Flaky? Oh, yeah. And Some Dean's maybe erased. I love how Dean's saying the same thing I did. We should go off his space on them because that's, I didn't even see your comment, Dean. I was already headed in that direction. But apparently, Dean works in a printing company. So, yes, we do feel very sorry for Our you. Dean. Yes. I love Kelly's comment. I have to put it up. I have to. I have an image somewhere of a children's book cover, the printer that simply worked and other fairy tales. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, I have a, a laser jet that I absolutely loved because it was just really small and would, would print um, both in color and black and white. But when I upgraded, I think I, I either upgraded my Mac OS or switched computers and upgraded my Mac OS. And then every time I plugged it in, it would just spit out pages and pages of random code. And I could not get it to stop. I I think I had it, I can't remember if I had it plugged in directly to the um to my router or if I had it wireless, but it didn't, it just would not like every time I plugged it in, it would just start printing. Three weeks later, still printing. <laughs> I I had to un I had to unplug it and um throw it in the trash. No, it's still sitting here. I haven't, you know, decide, I haven't figured out if I just need to um cuz it, it automatically has the um the drivers downloaded. Um it has two letters as its name, so I think you can figure out what brand it is. Now I have an office jet or something, I don't know, one of the other ones. And it's it's fine. It doesn't randomly spew out 
pages and pages, like wasting yeah. 20 or 30 pages at a time before I can even stop it. Oh my God. So, um, I only, I only plug it in if I really, really want to print something, but yeah. I'm imagining like you pass, you pass the printer on from one generation to the next and each generation that plugs it in gets like 20 pages of code printed on and they learn to switch it off. And they ha, ha, it ha, ha. Well, I don't think I bought new color toner for it. So at least I didn't like buy a whole new set of three toners for $450. Um, I, I'll have to double check and see what the level is <laughs> so that I didn't waste all that money. Um, Brandon's Brandon telling me solutions for you. Yeah. Uh, it's only, it's only connect. I, thought, I think it was only connected to one printer, but yeah, you're right. I just, I just got so mad at it that I just really didn't feel like troubleshooting at the time. Cause I tried a couple of times, um, with the print queue and could not get it to, it still did it even after I cleared the print queue and everything. So yes, printers are lovely. Maybe I should take it out in the backyard and see if I have a bat somewhere. Actually, I have a sledgehammer. Maybe that'll be more fun. Oh, yeah. cool. That would go viral as a video for sure. Dean is saying maybe it's an early attempt at AI and it's learning to speak. <laughs> Too bad. Skynet is not going to happen in, in my network on my watch. I'm telling you right now, it's not. Okay. You can I mean, if any device is going to become sentient, it's not the printer. So I think we're going to be safe. It can't even do what it's programmed to do, let alone think for itself and then take over the world. <sighs> Moving on from <laughs> printers. Says, Becky equals Sarah Connor. Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> I haven't had any, anyone travel back into time and tell me that one of my children is going to save the world. So I think we're safe. All right. <laughs> Moving, moving on to other like long overdue IT things. The FCC has finally decreed that 25 Mbps download and three Mbps upload are not broadband speed. So today the FCC changed its definition of broad, broadband to, meet down, to mean download speeds of 100 Mbps and upload speeds of 20 Mbps. And it has been stuck at 25 Mbps slash three Mbps since 2015. As recently as 2021, outgoing FCC chairman Ajit Pai claimed that we, we don't need more than that. But these definitions matter because they let the FCC report whether it's, fail, uh, whether it's failing or succeeding to close the broadband gap and how much to regulate or throw money at broadband providers to spread decent internet across the US. The article actually has some really grim statistics about like rural America and like the lack of connectivity. But yeah, does does the FCC chairman understand what 25 and 3 mean? He's probably like it's faster than burning CDs. So <laughs> ah. Oh, Brandon still said... using his old BlackBerry. I know. Maybe God he still has a dial-up modem. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well. For legally, hey, be careful there. My parents <laughs> still have. My parents still live way out in the, the, you know, boonies, and they. I think they do still have AOL because because no one has fiber out that far. So. Kelly says, "Cool, thanks, FCC. Now make it so I can choose from more than one ISP." <laughs> So I can get anything resembling what you say should be broadband speed. I know. I mean, India's decent on the internet front. Like, data is really cheap. And then we have, like, more than one reliable this, ISP. This is the first place I've lived where I have a choice of two. <gasps> like, before it was just one. Free market. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. So now that that's finally been updated um TikTok ban this is something that everybody's been talking about so the new bill which would effectively ban TikTok in the US if the company doesn't split with its Chinese ownership has cleared a house vote President Biden has signaled his support for the legislation but the bill will still face a much rockier path in the Senate 
in spite of scattered support, it's very possible that the Senate doesn't share the House's overwhelming appetite for going after TikTok this year, which would either stall a potential TikTok ban or kill it outright. Fun fact, India already has banned TikTok for the same reasons that the US is talking about right now. So if another country were to ban them, then I think maybe something will change and then we can get TikTok back. That's the real agenda for me. <laughs> you remind me that my um, my senator actually sent out a survey recently asking for his constituents' opinion on whether or not you know, he should vote to ban TikTok. So it's interesting. Yeah. And there's like all kinds of protests and stuff going on. So I don't know. It was really popular in India. Like there were lots of people from like very different like socioeconomic backgrounds who were like finally making money because they were like TikTok celebrities. And then all of that got pulled out from under them like overnight basically and they lost a lot of income. So it comes back. Well, I think part of the problem, in addition to the whole thoughts about whether it's spyware, is so many of the challenges that go out that a lot of kids are participating in for whatever reason, clout or just following along. Some of them are are really, well, they're stupid, but they have also turned out to be dangerous. Um, you know, like yeah, there's some trends. Yeah, some of those trends, like a, a neighbor of mine got attacked by by uh several teenagers because it was a TikTok challenge to just go by and beat someone up. Um and then some of the schools were suffering from toilets getting ripped off the wall because that was another TikTok trend. And so some of them are just stupid. And of but course, I mean you know, this is like has been around since the days of like chain emails, right? So yeah. I feel like it, no, it's kids on Snapchat. So yeah, kids and um, impulsive behaviors. I think that it has spread more quickly that way. But whatever social media they're using, it's gonna it's gonna be the same, right? Oh, we've got a debate brewing. So Dean is saying no legislation required. If you don't want to use it, just don't use it. But Sam says that it's about the data mining and scraping that it does on the devices, which is why it should be banned. So there's no reason any application should have that level of data mining built into it. Yeah, I think they had the same concerns about like face app, which came out like during the pandemic and was giving you all these like aging filters and gender swap filters and stuff. And apparently the privacy permissions that it asked for were like, we can keep your data forever. Like even you can never erase it or never have us erase it. I'm, I mean, Sam's right. That's why I actually do not have it on my, my, mo my mobile phone. Um, I installed it on my iPad, which has very limited stuff. Like I don't have all of my normal information on there. My email or even my iMessages are turned off on that device for that reason. Yeah. So it um, can't mine all of my data. We will do just one last headline since we have one minute left. But hackers can apparently read private AI assistant chats even though they're encrypted. <laughs> so people using AI assistants are obviously asking like deeply personal questions like about their most private thoughts. Like it's obviously like all the scary stuff that you could type into Google is now being funneled through uh, AI like chatbots and stuff. So AI powered chat services are aware of the sensitivity of these discussions and have like encrypted them to prevent like snooping. But researchers have devised an attack that deciphers AI assistance responses with a surprising accuracy. So the technique exploits a side channel present in all major AI assistants with the exception of Google Gemini. I guess that's the only trustworthy one right now. It refines the fairly raw results through a large through a large language model specifically trained for this task. And they can basically get someone uh, with a passive adversary in the middle position, um, meaning the adversary can monitor data packets passing between the AI assistant and the user. And they can infer a specific topic of 55% of all captured responses, usually with high word accuracy. So the attack can basically deduce responses with perfect word accuracy 29% of the time. 
so much for encryption. It twenty nine percent of the time it works every time. Yeah, I mean, but now that this news is out there, I'm sure somebody's gonna like try to do better. So, but this is the first time I'm hearing about like adversary in the middle as opposed to man in the middle. Maybe it's like a new gender neutral term. <laughs> adversary in the middle. Women can be hackers too. Oh goodness. So yeah. what is the what are they trying to do with this? Um just trying to snoop what people are reading? Yeah, basically. I mean, I guess if they can figure out what you're googling or asking about, they can sell that to advertisers, right? Oh, not interesting. So the so the headline says hackers and now but in the middle of the article it says researchers have devised yeah. an attack. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, it's a thin line apparently. <laughs> thin line between hacker and researcher. <laughs> oh my god. So that's that's that. So be very careful what yeah. you're typing into. Anything. Yes. Again, yeah. the best safety and the best security is to just unplug everything and move to the middle of the forest. Reconnect with nature. You may be eaten by a bear, but there will be no adversary in the middle. I think that is the adversary, but I guess it wouldn't there, be in the middle. Be no adversary. Exactly. Not in the middle. Just a straight up, direct, honest adversary. Yeah. No Malcolm in the middle. Just straight up you versus the bear. Yep. All right. And one quick thing that what I was laughing about in the beginning was the last headline that Irvishi had had included. And we don't have time to talk about it, but it was around the whole controversy about Kate Middleton and photoshopping, supposedly photoshopping the picture of her and her kids and whether or not because they're I don't even follow the royal family, and it is everywhere. All these conspiracies yep. about where she is, whether or not she's really alive, <laughs> yeah. or or at the or at the palace, and how this photo got out, and yet there's pieces of it that you can tell it's Photoshop, and why the royal family is always super quiet about stuff and controlling the narrative, and yet Kate released a statement about it anyway. If you want to go down a rabbit hole today or the weekend, just Google it. Or just it. sit tight and there will be a Netflix documentary, expose, true crime, something, something out in like 60 days. So just hang in there. I, don't it go. is. I, I don't know writing it right now. why people care this much. It's like she's recovering from something. She's supposed to be out until after Easter. Let the woman be. But no. Uh, Dean says it's because they're lizard people and he's British so he can say that <laughs> alright Dean we'll expect regular updates from you since you're since you're British and you can give us all the updates our closest correspondent Brandon yes. has a work question um, for user enrolled iOS devices Sergi uh, should they be checking in on the jump cloud console I seem to get one check in and then it stops communicating sounds like you need to get in touch with support yeah, I would, be I would take in. a look at. Yes, they should be checking in the APNS communication device changes or whatnot. Should there should be a poll for that as well? Uh oh, Dean has. Uh, Dean is no longer here. Mi five has <laughs> taken over his account. So, sorry, Dean. We didn't mean to get you in trouble. Um, I hope you There's reappear a... soon, and hope you're okay. They'll make a they'll make a Bond movie about you, so it'll be okay. It'll be worth it. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for all the questions for Sergey and everything. That was that was really great. As always, we appreciate your um, how active you are and in interacting and having fun in the comments. Um, highlight of our week, and uh, we will see you next week. And uh, Sam says, send Agent J after him. <laughs> and uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll try. We'll try. Uh, so thank you all. We'll see you next week. And uh, hope you have a great weekend. So take care, everyone. Bye. Cheers, folks.